This video is about identifying prepositions, so finding them in a text, and then finding the boundaries of the phrases. Where does the prepositional phrase start and where does it end? And this should help you with exercises 1 and 5 and 10. 1 is about finding the boundaries of the phrases. 5 and 10 are about distinguishing prepositions from adjectives and adverbs. So first let's consider four properties of prepositions. They have others, but let's consider mainly three of these. The first one is that prepositions don't inflect. This can actually help you distinguish them from adjectives. If you find a word that has a comparative and a superlative form, it's definitely not a preposition. But other than that, the property that they don't inflect is pretty simple. Um, it's just that they don't have any affixes unlike some other classes like adjectives, adverbs, and verbs. And nouns also can become plural, right? Okay, but the other three properties are more complex, and we're going to talk about those at length. Pre prepositions are the head of a phrase all the time. They're always the head of a phrase. And they can be dependents of nouns and dependents of verbs, and they can be complements of the verb be. Those are going to help you distinguish them from other kinds of words, other word categories. And some prepositions license noun phrase complements. Most of them do, actually, but not all. Let's consider first the second one. Prepositions are the head of a phrase. Here are some examples. He lost the diabetes immediately after the surgery. After is the preposition, right? This is one that you can pick out that nobody would argue about, right? So we know it's the head of the phrase, immediately is modifying it, and the surgery is its complement. And we know that's a prepositional phrase. We know that that's a phrase because it can be replaced all with one word. He lost the diabetes then, right? We could also drop the modifiers and keep just the head. He lost the diabetes after. Now, we wouldn't do that except in context, right? But in context, you could. Somebody could ask you, now, did he lose the diabetes before the surgery or after? And you could say after. You couldn't say immediately, and you couldn't say the surgery. You can drop all of the phrase except the head in those cases. The head is after. So we know it's a phrase, and we know it's a prepositional phrase because the head is a preposition. Your second example is she's clear after being fully informed that it is what she really wants. Same preposition, right? After. It has a complement again, being fully informed. That complement's not a noun phrase, right? It's a non-finite clause. Don't worry about that. We'll talk more about the complements later. But this is a prepositional phrase just like immediately after the surgery. After is the head. And then in the third example, you see a different kind of complement again, a finite clause. After students have completed their designs. Right? And again, somebody would say, now would the students create their second concept map after they've completed their designs or before? And you could say after. You could answer with just the head of the phrase. So it's, it's functionally the same as after with a noun phrase complement. It's just a prepositional phrase with a different kind of complement. The fact that prepositions are the head of a phrase helps you distinguish them from subordinators. What you may have been taught to call a word like after when its complement is a finite clause, like after students have completed their designs, is a subordinator. You may have been taught that words like after and when and before and since and until are subordinators when they have a clause as a complement. There's really no reason to think that. It's much simpler if you believe that prepositions can have clauses for complements. Then after is a preposition all the time. You don't have to say it's a preposition when its complement is a noun phrase, like after the party, but it's a subordinator when its complement is a clause, like after we're finished. You could just say it's a preposition all the time. The other reason 
for calling these words prepositions and not subordinators is that they don't act like the two words that we know are subordinators, or the three words. We'll get to that in a minute. The two words that we know are subordinators are that and whether. So here's an example of each one. We know that students have completed their designs. In that case, that is a subordinator, right? The complement of no is students have completed their designs. It's that clause. And that marks it as a subordinate clause. Note that you can drop that. We know students have completed their designs. We do that all the time. That can't possibly be the head of the phrase because you can leave it out and there's no effect. And notice another thing about the prepositional phrase headed by after in the first sentence is how easily it moves around. You can say, students would create a second concept map after they've completed their designs. There's no problem moving, and moving a prepositional phrase around in the main clause. A subordinate clause doesn't move that easily. You wouldn't say that students have completed their designs we know. If, you th if that's possible at all, it's much, much rarer, right? You wouldn't say whether students have completed their designs we don't know. So the fact that sometimes a subordinator can be omitted when it's that, right? Not when it's whether, because that one needs to be there to mark the clause as interrogative and subordinate. Right? And also the fact that subordinate clauses don't move around when, when they don't have a preposition, when they're not inside a prepositional phrase, subordinate clauses don't move around inside a sentence, distinguishes them from a prepositional phrase with an actual preposition as a head. Right? So we are going to say that the only subordinators in English are that and whether, right? Other things that you may have thought of as subordinators, we're going to say are prepositions. They just can take a clause as a complement. Now here's the one snag to that is that sometimes whether can also, you can substitute if for whether. Sometimes you can substitute if for whether. So technically there are three subordinators. There's that, whether, and if. If is also sometimes a preposition, so this is a little bit tricky. Compare these three sentences. We don't know whether students have completed their designs. You could also say, we don't know if students have completed their designs. It's exactly the same sentence, right? So in that case, we can't argue that if is anything except the exact same thing as whether. It fits in exactly the same place, and it gives you exactly the same structure. So whether and if are the two subordinators that mark subordinate clauses that are interrogative. We'll talk more about those later in a different chapter, so don't worry too much now. Now look at the second sentence. When logging in, they see if the picture is displayed to verify they are on the right site. Can you swap out weather there? Listen to it in your head. Does it sound good with weather? It does, right? They see whether the picture is displayed. So if there is a subordinator, right? However, look at the third sentence. It will be difficult for them to be counted if we don't know the count ourselves. It will be difficult for them to be counted whether we don't know the count ourselves. No, <laughs> bad sentence. In that case, we have to say if is not the same as whether. And you see a meaning difference too, right? This is setting up a condition. It's not just telling you a question in a subordinate form. If like that, you could swap out other prepositions, right? It wouldn't make sense, but it would be grammatical to say it would be difficult for them to be counted unless we don't know the count ourselves. That doesn't make sense, but it sounds like good grammar, right? It is good grammar. You can put prepositions in that place. So if, when it's doing this, when it's setting up a condition, is a preposition. And you can always tell because just try substituting whether. If it works, that's a subordinator. If it doesn't work, that's a preposition. So the three subordinators in English are that, whether, and if. 
Don't try to call anything else a subordinator. Um, if it's something that might be a preposition, then test to see if it's an adverb or an adjective, and if not, it's probably a preposition. Now let's talk about property number three. A characteristic of prepositions is that they can be dependents of nouns, dependents of verbs, and complements of the be verb. They're very flexible in this way. Here is an example. Hirai went on to say that Sony was working on a new generation of laptops. A new generation of laptops is a noun phrase, right? Inside that noun phrase, there's a prepositional phrase. You're seeing it? So the head of the whole noun phrase is generation, and inside that noun phrase is the prepositional phrase of laptops. The head of that prepositional phrase is of. The complement is laptops, right? If we ask ourselves, what is that prepositional phrase doing? Well, it's inside the noun phrase, so it must have a role in there. Generation. It's actually a complement of generation, I would argue. We don't have to worry, though, about whether it's a complement or a modifier, because prepositional phrases can be either. They can just be general dependents inside noun phrases. In a minute, you'll see how that contrasts with adverbs. Look at the other example now. Noted that it was something the geekier guys at work know more about. And by the way, uh, Kazuo Hirai didn't really say this. I was just reading The Onion again. All right, but the noun phrase, the geekier guys at work, you, it's a whole phrase, right? Because you could replace it all with a pronoun. You could say it was something they know more about. So we know that's all one phrase. The head of it is guys. Everything else is a dependent. At work is a prepositional phrase dependent. So they can be dependents of nouns. And here you see that if you are trying to distinguish a preposition from an adverb, this is one of the properties that will help you. And this is what you're going to do in exercise 10, okay? So do this test. A preposition can head a phrase that's dependent on a noun, and an adverb can't do that. An adverb phrase can't be dependent on a noun. So look what happens here. Sony was working on a new generation powerfully. A new generation powerfully is not a phrase, right? Powerfully doesn't belong in there. What could it possibly be modifying? Now, you could find an adverb in that place if we took away the brackets, right? If we put, we could put an adverb at that place in the sentence, but it wouldn't be inside the noun phrase. You could say, Sony was working on a new generation skillfully or energetically, but that adverb would not be modifying a new generation. It would be modifying working. So it would be inside the verb phrase alongside the noun phrase. See, if you went to replace a new generation, you would say, Sony was working on it energetically. You couldn't say Sony was working on it, and that also include energetically, right? Adverbs don't depend on nouns. The second property, well, actually, it's the third one, that the prepositional phrases can be the complement of the be verb, also helps you distinguish prepositions from adverbs. This is another thing prepositions can do, and adverbs can't. So here is a case of a prepositional phrase doing that. The high school teacher was, high school teacher subject, right? Was the head of the verb phrase, and then... You have to have a complement to was. There's nothing else for this to do. In a doctoral program at that time, the be verb always wants a complement, right? Sometimes it's a predicative complement, but it can be a prepositional phrase. The high school teacher was in a doctoral program. Now, what happens if we try to put in an adverb there? The high school teacher was ambitiously. Ha. Huh. 
Ambitious, yeah, because a prep there you could have a PC there, and it could be an adjective. So this is not a test that will help you distinguish a prepositional phrase from an adjective, but it'll help you distinguish it from an adverb. Here's another example, Mr. Speaker. Thanks so much for being. Now the complement of being with us, a prepositional phrase. Mr. Speaker, thanks so much for being graciously. Bad sentence. Adverbs cannot complement be. And then the second property, adverbs in addition to being the complement of be and being dependence on nouns can, of course, also be dependence on verbs. He accepted the fact that they lived in a different world than he. This is a long prepositional phrase, right? In a different world than he. But it's headed by in, right? So it's a prepositional phrase that is dependent on the head verb lived. If we made the verb phrase, it would start right after they, right? They is the subject and everything else is a predicate. They lived in a different world than he. So you've got the verb and you've got a dependent. Here's another one. They returned to the park. And then each spring is also inside the verb phrase, right? But it's not inside this prepositional phrase. It's not to the park each spring. You could say they return there each spring. You could put a pro form in for the prepositional phrase. And it would be dependent on the verb, just like the prepositional phrase to the park is dependent on the verb. So those are the three, are three of the things that prepositional phrases can do. The fourth property is that most of them license noun phrase complements. And these, this is the kind that you're used to seeing, right? So you just saw the one in a different world than he. So the head is in, and a different world than he is a noun phrase. You're seeing the head of it, right? World. Everything else modifies world. Yeah. And you saw another example. Return to the park. The park is a noun phrase. Now, some of them don't license MP complements, and some of them can, but don't always. Right? I think two does. You wouldn't just say two and then stop. Although you might be able to have a different kind of compliment. We'd have to consider that. But here, look at the one afterwards. I think how they acted afterwards is very shocking. There's no afterwards noun phrase, right? It's not how they acted afterwards the statement. After the statement, right? But when you say afterwards... It's going in exactly the same place as a prepositional phrase. How they acted after the statement. How they acted afterwards. It's going right in the same place and having exactly the same function as a prepositional phrase. Our argument, therefore, is that it is a prepositional phrase. It just doesn't have a complement. It stands by itself. Another one that does that often, but optionally, is outside. He takes his coffee with him as he steps outside. Now this one can have a noun phrase complement. He takes his coffee with him as he steps outside the house. But, you know, we say stuff like go outside all the time. And go outside and go outside the house are just exactly the same structure. They're a verb and then something that's dependent on the verb and is inside the verb phrase, and when it's outside the house, it's pretty clearly a prepositional phrase, right? Because it's licensing a noun phrase complement. And so when it's go outside, we're going to make the same claim. It's also a prepositional phrase. It's just not licensing a noun phrase complement. So the fact that a preposition can license a noun phrase complement in some cases will help you distinguish it from an adjective. Adjectives can never do that. So look at this. They returned to the park is good. They returned faithful the park is very, very bad. Impossible. They returned safe the park is impossible. 
Why is it impossible? Because the park is sitting there and it doesn't have any place in the structure because nothing is licensing it and nothing is there for it to be a dependent of. An adjective doesn't have noun phrase complements. Now we've just seen that not all prepositions have noun phrase complements. So when you do exercise five, be careful about this. Remember the principle is that if the word can license a noun phrase complement, it's definitely not an adjective. So your proof is pretty much done. You don't need to do any other tests. But if it can't license a noun phrase complement, it still might be a preposition because some of them don't. In that case, you do a further test. For example, remember the first property that um, prepositions don't have any morphology. They don't take any affixes. But adjectives do usually take comparative and superlative. So go ahead and do the test about comparative and superlative. If you can get something like safer, safest, then you've shown that it's an adjective and not a preposition, and once again, your proof is done. If it doesn't take morphology, then you have some more evidence that it's probably not an adjective, but you should do a further test to see. You should do the predicate test. All right. Um, so here, just for a brief review, are the properties of prepositions that will help you with these. They don't inflect, no morphology. They are the head of a phrase, they're not subordinators. They can be dependents of nouns, dependents of verbs, and complements of be. This is in contrast. Some of these properties are in contrast to adjectives and adverbs, and some of them license noun phrase complements. Adjectives don't. Now the last thing I want to do is let's practice We've done this indirectly a little, but let's practice finding the beginnings and ends of them. Usually they come first in the phrase, but they can have a modifier in front of them. So you can say, um, under the couch, but you can say, right under the couch. And you can say, after the meeting, but you can say, immediately after the meeting. So there, it's possible that they'll have a, one word or just a short phrase in front of them, so check for that. But usually the problems come identifying the end of the prepositional phrase. So remember to look for what's dependent on the preposition and try substitution tests. If you substitute a word like there or then, how much of the sentence do you leave out? Okay, let's practice. Here is the onion article. Remember this isn't true, it's satire. That about Kazuo Hirai, and let's look through this and try to identify prepositional phrases. All right, pause the video and read the first sentence and look for a prepositional phrase. I believe there's only one in the first sentence. Yes, there is. So look for a prepositional phrase, find its head, and then find where it should begin and end. Pause the video and then come back. All right, in the first sentence, the prepositional phrase is at a press event. Now, I hope you didn't include today. If you did, you know, that's, that's, I, this was, was a little bit difficult. I questioned myself about whether today belongs in there. And why I decided it didn't is this. You could swap the order of those two phrases. Kazuo Hirai announced today at a press event that blah, blah, blah. If you can do that, they have to be two different phrases. You wouldn't be moving things around inside your phrase like that. So I'm arguing that at a press event is the end. And you can also say, Kazuo Hirai announced there today, which stylistically is bad, but grammatically is okay. Second sentence, pause the video. Let me see how many there are in here. One, two, is all I see. Pause your video and find two of them. Okay, what I'm seeing in number two is 
on it. Do you see that? Some pretty cool first person shooting games on it. A short one, right? But since you have the word and after, and it's not on it and on something else, it's pretty clear that it ends there. I don't think you have any trouble with that. And nothing's modifying on. And the other one, did you get this one? Because this is one of the ones that would traditionally be called a subordinator, but your book argues that it's not. You see it? It's while. While, now what's the complement of it? It's a clause. He's not personally into this sort of thing. That's the end of that clause, right? The subject is he, and the predicate is, is not personally into this sort of thing. So while he's not personally into this sort of thing is a prepositional phrase. Now, I hope that you didn't indicate any of the infinitive phrases. The word to can throw you off, and don't let it, because to is a preposition sometimes. But notice that no prepositions have bare verbs as complements, right? We saw some that had nine finite clauses, but those clauses were headed by um, gerund participles or past participles. Gerund participles or past participles. When you see something like to have, or where's the other one? To play Blu-ray, those are infinitives. The to is not heading the phrase there. The verb is heading the phrase. So when you see to followed by a beer verb, don't mark those. Now let's move on to the third sentence. Let me see how many I see here. To be called, we will not do, right? Because to be called is an infinitive. Mm, I see one, two, and that's all. So pause the video and look for two prepositional phrases. All right, sentence three. The first one I see is headed by from. From what everyone's been telling me. That's a noun phrase. Don't worry about its structure. Just worry about the fact that you can tell where it ends. You can tell where it ends, right? From what everyone's been telling me could be removed from the sentence. You could say, but it's supposed to be pretty cool. When you can take something out as a unit, that's pretty much like the substitution test. How much you can take out tells you the boundaries. Could we substitute anything for that? I think so, which again I know is just super lame, but therefore it's supposed to be pretty cool. I changed the meaning there, but nevertheless in the structure, that part can be replaced. So that's one, and then the second one is for being a video game thing. Now in this case, the complement is one of those non-finite clauses we talked about. The head is not be, it's being. That's fine, being a video game thing is fine. A non-finite clause headed by a gerund participle can be the object of a preposition. Notice that it can be the object of a preposition that's not to, for being a video game thing. So we know for sure that that one's not an infinitive because the preposition's not to. And therefore, even if we put in the preposition to, we'd say it's not an infinitive, right? But to be pretty cool is an infinitive. That one's not a prepositional phrase. The next sentence, it could end up being kind of neat to have around the house. Now this one, we could talk about up. Um, but let's not, because this is one of those phrasal verbs, and that's in a different part of the chapter. So let's say if you call up a prepositional phrase here, or if you don't call it a prepositional phrase, I'm okay either way, because actually you just have to say more about it to talk about that one. Let's go on to the next sentence, which doesn't have any, just as a fun dweeby toy. The last sentence, however, does. Let me see here. There's... There's one that's quite easy to spot and another that's weird. So pause the video and find one that's clear. Did you find it? Working on a new generation of laptops. 
And we could again say that working on is a phrasal verb, but let's not worry about that. There is a preposition there and there is a noun phrase. So we'd probably call that a prepositional phrase. And then if we wanted to talk more about phrasal verbs, we would. But look at the tricky one at the end of the sentence. You see the pre a preposition at the end of the sentence? About as a preposition, right? The last clause here could have gone like this, but noted that it was something about which the geekier guys at work know more. I'll do it one more time. Noted that it was something about which the geekier guys at work know more. Now there, it would be real easy to mark the prepositional phrase, right? You would have about as the head and which as the complement. However, in this, and that would be a fronted preposition. And that's what I'm getting at. Your book talks about fronted prepositions and stranded prepositions. And those are sort of outside the scope of what I'm talking about today. But since we had one here, I just thought I would bring it up. About is a preposition and it's heading a phrase, but when they get stranded and left at the end of a sentence like that, it becomes very difficult to find their boundaries. In your exercise one, you won't have any stranded ones. Don't worry about that. So when you do exercise one, if you're not sure, find the head, see if it has any modifiers before it. But then if you're not sure about the end boundary, try replacing it with something or try taking it out. See how much of it you can replace without losing any meaning or see how much of it you can take out but still leave other meaningful parts. So here is the final slide with all of the prepositional phrases marked. The ones in blue are the ones that you really wouldn't need to worry about, but just in case you were curious, I marked them.